Galileo was born into a world where each morning reaffirmed the common view that the sun moved around the earth. This belief was confirmed as the sun appeared to pass overhead each day. It was a view of the universe originally set out by the ancient philosopher Aristotle. In the center sat the static earth, the home of man. The sun was just one of many heavenly bodies which circled endlessly around it. Dissenting from this accepted worldview could prove hazardous. A statue of Father Giordano Bruno marks the site in Rome where he was burned alive for a host of unorthodox beliefs. The Vatican considered astronomy to be an investigation of God's work. The church's universities had seven basic subjects that you had to pass before you could go on to philosophy and theology. One of those subjects was astronomy. Studying the stars was a way of getting themselves out of the mundane world into a world that was more transcendent, a world that was beautiful, a world that was eternal. For the church, there was also a practical reason to study the heavens. The sky was both a clock and a calendar. Behind the walls of convents, sunrise and sunset defined the cycle of morning and evening prayer. Each spring, the planting of the gardens would commence with the coming of the equinox. The winter solstice foreshadowed Christmas and the phases of the moon fixed the exact dates of Lent and Easter. The church used the calendar to give spiritual significance to Aristotle's earth-centered astronomy. The images were very useful for teaching theology. The Earth is not the center of the universe in that it's a, in a privileged place. It's at the bottom of the universe. Only hell is lower. And there's a chain of creation reaching up to heaven. As a young man, Galileo toyed briefly with the idea of becoming a priest. Instead, he entered the University of Pisa as a medical student in 1581. The curriculum at Pisa was prescribed by the Jesuit authorities in Rome. Even the anatomy diagrams in Galileo's textbooks had to be approved by the Jesuits. Galileo left medicine behind after only a few months and began instead to study mathematics. Among the many writings he left behind is an eloquent tribute to the power of mathematics to illuminate the world. This grand book, The Universe, could only be understood if one learned to comprehend the language and the alphabet in which it is composed. That is, the language of mathematics. Triangles and circles and geometric figures without which it was impossible, humanly impossible to understand a word of it. Without it, one wandered as in a dark labyrinth. It's so confusing, the world. Where do we find truth? Where is the real truth? And there was a sort of consensus which Galileo felt very deeply that in mathematics you had real truth. If there was anywhere where human beings could think like God, it was when they were thinking about mathematics. So let's combine precise observation of nature and let's apply that one technique of thought which we know God will share with us, which is mathematics, and let's put the two together, and then we will have a really secure foundation on which we can study things. Galileo brought his mathematical studies to the University of Padua, 40 miles from Venice, far enough from Rome to be beyond the influence of the Jesuits and their officially approved curriculum. 
in Padua itself was a university. It was founded in 1222 by breakaway students. It wasn't chartered by a king or by a pope. It was absolutely free and had the Free Republic of Venice as its supervisor. So getting a job in Padua was as close to getting academic freedom as you could want, certainly in Italy and probably rather uniquely in Europe. The city of Venice was just a ferry ride from Padua, and it was here that the young professor spent many holidays. Galileo began a liaison with a Venetian woman named Marina Gamba. Little is known about her, but she was far from Galileo's social equal. The affair made his life complicated, but was not unusual, even among faithful Catholics. Yes, he loved to have a good time. He enjoyed his wine. He, he enjoyed many forms of pleasure. But that didn't make him a bad Catholic, especially at a time when even uh, the popes had illegitimate children. Galileo himself had three illegitimate children. The eldest, Virginia, was born in 1600. The birth records in Padua say that she was born of fornication. Because Galileo was not married to her mother, they didn't live together. I suppose he might have lived with her if he'd wanted to, but his house was full of students, and he worked at odd hours, so he didn't really keep his mistress or his children in the house where he lived. Despite these complications, Galileo thrived in the free air of Padua, becoming an ambitious scholar. Always fascinated by new devices, Galileo heard that a craftsman from the Netherlands had found a new use for common eyeglass lenses. The first telescope to reach Venice was a toy, a novelty built to amuse partygoers. Spectacles compared to telescopes are very low tech, but they had been around for several hundred years. It was only when lenses became available in certain range of strengths that one could take the weakest convex lens and combine it with the strongest concave lens and get an appreciable magnifying effect. Galileo set out to turn the Dutchman's toy into a useful device. Hearing reports of a new invention from a lens maker in Holland, I determined to fashion a device for myself and was able to make considerable improvements in it. Galileo realized that spectacle makers could not give him the lenses that he needed in order to make this device more powerful. They just weren't good enough and they weren't uh, the right strength. And so in order to improve the instrument, he had to teach himself to grind lenses. And that is extremely difficult. And it certainly was in 1610. At first, Galileo was only interested in the optics of the telescope. With his improved lenses, he increased its power tenfold. But his lenses did more than magnify. By reshaping these pieces of glass, Galileo would eventually reshape our view of the world. With his telescope, Galileo first set out to make some money. The naval arsenal of Venice was the greatest in all of Europe. What if the arsenal had a way to spot enemy ships hours before they appeared in the harbor? Wouldn't this give the Navy a distinct advantage? Installing his new device at the top of St. Mark's Tower, Galileo arranged persuasive, real-life demonstrations. Numerous gentlemen and senators more than once climbed the stairs of the highest bell towers of Venice to observe vessels so far away at sea that two hours and more were required before they could be seen by naked eye without my spyglass.
From within the Venetian Senate came a handsome order for Galileo to supply the arsenal with spyglasses. Galileo was given a generous lifetime salary for his service to the Republic. Part scientist and part self-promoter, for now, his future seemed bright. But soon, his telescope would launch a dispute which would threaten to destroy its creator.